This is going to be an incredibly fun session, very different from a lot of the things I think that are here at Aspen. Um, going to talk about futuristic technology, going to talk about designing for um, technologies that eradicate space and time. Um, and I'm going to break it up into two pieces, and I'll inter introduce our panelists in just a second. Um, first, we're going to talk about the Hyperloop how it works, um, and you know, maybe put our skeptical hats on for a minute, poke at the concept. And then I think in the second uh, half, we'll just sort of assume it's going to work. So sit on your hands during that part, and we're going to say, OK, this technology works perfectly. What does this mean for the design uh, of cities? What does this mean for the design of nations? What does this mean for you know, 22nd century transportation networks? Um, we have people uh, who can comment on this and in a way that very few others can. Um, sitting right next to me, we have Josh uh, Giegel. He's the CTO of Virgin Hyperloop One. Um, he was also a co-founder uh, mm -hmm. of the company. Um, he's got a background in thermodynamics, heat transfer, compressible fluid dynamics, uh, and other scientific concepts, which I'm sure we all have a very firm grasp of. Um, <laughs> Jakob Lang uh, is with the architecture and design firm Big. Uh, he's worked on several of their award-winning uh, projects, including the Tallinn Town Hall uh, in Estonia, um, which is a fascinating place. Um, and he's also working on, uh, he's the head of Big Ideas, uh, which is the architecture firm Big's kind of technology-driven special projects um, wing. So uh, to start us off, in case anybody hasn't seen uh, Hyperloop videos or the way that this might look, we have a, a short video to show you. It's like a minute and a half long. We'll turn up the music. It'll you know, get you ready for the future here. Um, so if we can check it out, assuming it works. I want to break this down a little bit um, and have, uh, have you go through some of these technologies, Josh, um, because it sort of is like flying in a tunnel underground in a two in a pod car. Yeah? I mean how do you how do you exactly, describe this exactly. when you like, you know, someone is encountering the concept uh, so, new? So basically taking going the speed of an aircraft but just a couple of feet off the ground. Um, so the reason that we have that we have a tube and that keeps everything outside, outside, everything inside, inside. So you don't have to worry about weather. You don't have to worry about animals crossing the road. You don't have to worry about things that, I'll say, make an autonomous vehicle very difficult to, to do. Like people walking like around. Like people walking around or children chasing after balls. Then we use magnetic levitation to levitate. Now, the video just showed renderings, but we have a test site in Las Vegas where we've actually uh, built a full-scale version of these. We got it up to about 240 miles an hour about two years ago. And we continue to do a lot of different testing, a lot of different, actually, validation of the system there. So we use maglev, um, but this isn't the maglev that you've heard about for a long time. This is something that we've developed over the last two or three years. And because maglev, or like I like to call my grandmother's maglev, has a bad stigma. It's really expensive really didn't work in terms of economically. And so we built something that has no active, no moving parts on the track. And it allows you to have multiple vehicles going very fast in a row without having to have anything, I'll say, move, which means you can have large amounts of people going from place to place. So how have you imagined like a fully built out system would actually work? Obviously, we saw one pod there. And, yep. and Jakob, feel free to chime in here too. Like, What would this actually? look like as a system that you get on like a bus? I think from a, a standpoint where we're at, we're, we're looking to move large amounts of people. So we have a couple of projects in the US. We've got the biggest one and the furthest along is in India connecting Mumbai and Pune. It's about 80 miles apart, five hour car, drive, car ride, 20 minutes in a Hyperloop. But when you get in, this is something that we've, we've done a, quite a bit of thinking on is this idea of never missing a train and or sorry, a train, um, ne never missing a pod. And the idea that you have your pod has you and 25 other people. You're not stopping at every place along the way. You're going direct to your destination. Um, you want to talk a little bit about how you view it from an architect's yeah. point of view? Yeah, so uh, obviously, because this is a completely new uh, type of transportation, we also have the, the, um, the, the opportunity to think all the way from scratch. Uh, what kind of transportation uh, is it that we w want to create? And we've had a lot of discussions about uh, some of the things that, that uh, uh, we are experiencing today when we are going to a, a foreign country. First, you are taking a taxi to uh, 
maybe down to the, the metro line that takes you to the airport, then you get out, put in your bags, and you uh, have to wait for a little while, then you go on the shuttle bus into the plane, and the, the same thing repeats in the other end. So effectively, you end up sort of changing modes of transportation uh, five, six, seven times. So we discussed this in the beginning three years ago when we first time uh, uh, started working together, if there was a way that we could really try to eliminate a lot of these different steps. And so we've gone through a lot of different uh, sort of iterations and the, the whole system has evolved uh, greatly since. And, and, and lastly, we've been looking at, at what the, the station looks like right. uh, in, in Mumbai and Pune in India. And uh, how is it not just a train station? Like, why do you need something different from the train station paradigm? Uh, you could say that uh, every time you go to an airport or a train station, you sort of come through the main, main door, uh, and you have this sort of big panel of, uh, of sort of letters that you need to find the right uh, place, and the train leaves in 20 minutes, or you are just two minutes late. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. this. But mm -hmm. in this case, because they are, they are leaving all the time, uh, perhaps it would be possible to have a door uh, when you enter the station that is designated uh, where you're going. So you might go into the door that takes you to LA. Or, uh, so you don't really need to sort of uh, mess around with, uh, with uh, uh, maps and apps and so on to take you uh, to the right uh, uh, You just part. walk in and there's doors with destinations. You just <laughs> right in principle, there. you could do that, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. So um, one of the things that people have noted about Hyperloop systems is that um, they are kind of a, a variation of what's called a vac train, you know, in the sense that the tube um, is a vacuum, or at least is uh, very low pressure, and that there are versions of this that have existed, you know, this uh, rocketry visionary. Goddard was, you know, proposed a version of this, you know, in I think the 20s. Yeah. yeah. And then you had Rand, you know, the big uh, military research group, uh, among other things they research, uh, proposing this again in the 70s. So what um, what changed um, to bring this back into sort of the public consciousness and then into these spin-offs of companies? Smallness in one word. So everything has gotten quite a bit smaller from computers when Rand first came out that were the size of you know, a room, to batteries that are now can fit in a car and drive 300 miles, to just the power electronics. Like we're putting roughly a locomotive's worth of power on each vehicle, but doing it in something that's a lot smaller than a locomotive. Um, so everything has gotten quite a bit smaller. Processing power has gotten a lot faster. And more importantly, I think materials have evolved in a way that when the Germans or the Japanese built theirs, uh, there weren't permanent magnets like these rare earth neodymium magnets that existed. And so it's really kind of the, the, the crossing of technology moving to a spot where, yeah, you could have made one with Goddard. It probably would have been the most expensive thing ever built. It probably would have been the second most expensive thing ever built if they built in the 70s with, with Rand. But for us now, we can actually... It'll just be the third most expensive thing. <laughs> uh, no, there's some pretty expensive drains out there. But for, for us, like, what you're actually seeing is a huge amount of money being invested in things that aren't going very, very I'll say, incremental speed. So the Silk Road going from Beijing to like Berlin, right? They're investing $100 billion to improve the speed on that route from 50 kilometers an hour to 70. $100 billion they're gonna invest and they're only gonna improve the speed by 20%. Yeah. And so like, if that's what people are willing to do, we're talking about going two or three times faster than high speed rail, which is five or 10 times faster than what currently is trains going on that route. But you know, we have a technology that does that, the plane. Mm -hmm. um, like how, how much of is it an improvement on, on planes? Like how do you see it as, is it just purely that there's sort of you could achieve higher throughput. It's that, and you could do it for about five times less cost. So, when you, you imagine, like when it's fully scaled up. Yeah, and so it's mainly a plane has to fight through air, but a plane doesn't really have to fight through air at 200,000 feet or inside the air pressure in the tube. Yeah. And so that allows us to go the speed of an aircraft for roughly the same energy consumption as, as a truck, and doing that at just far more economical. Huh. Um, 
So one of the things I thought you were going to say was that the reason to do this or what's changed is sort of a growing awareness of climate change. And of course, we don't really have a replacement uh, for fossil jet fuel yet, certainly one that could support the entire you know, air infrastructure that exists. Um, from your perspective, um, do you see climate as like a big forcing uh, mechanism here, or do you, or not? Yeah, um, we were uh, talking about this yesterday when we were hiking in the mountains. Uh, uh, a year ago, we went through the Greenlandic uh, ice, from the ice cap out to the coast on skis on a seven days without cellular connection. And one of the other, our friends that was there, Andrew Magnusson, he has been uh, uh, writing uh, books about time and uh, the decisions we are making today, how big an impact they are actually making. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an example, he was saying, so how far out in the future do you think that somebody that you love dearly uh, will be affected by the decisions that you are making today? And then he was doing the sort of the math. He was saying, um, I am uh, today, I'm uh, 40, uh, 41 years old, maybe, uh, or I'll, I'll hopefully live another 40 years, and at that time, uh, I'll have a grandchild uh, uh, that would be 10 years old, and I'll, I'll love this child dearly. Uh, I'll uh, share stories with the child, and we'll have a really good time. Uh, at that point, that child will grow up and maybe live 100 years. Um, so that means that somebody that I loved dearly in my life, uh, 130 years from now, will be affected by the decisions that we are making today. Mm -hmm. So it just means that suddenly, this abstract thing about talking about climate change and we have to do, make changes to the way that we live and, and so on, and we are t saying that in 30 years, and it's quite abstract, mm -hmm. but, but if, you, if you tie it to somebody that you dearly love, uh, which is going to be my grandchild. Yeah. And that grandchild will tell stories about her, her grandfather that lived, yeah. that taught her about life. Uh, I, I think when you put it in that perspective, mm -hmm. I think it's just extremely important that we all do our thing to change. And I think Hyperloop One is, is one of those technologies because it can be purely based on, on, on sustainable technologies. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, the question that I think has to be asked of like all perspective climate solutions is just can, can it be done sort of with the speed and at the scale that it actually has an impact on the, the, the size of the problem? Um, and so it brings me to everybody's favorite topic, which is property rights acquisition for, <laughs> um, for this kind of thing, right? Because while you're right that a plane, you know, has to fight the air, you have to fight like sort of existing landowners who, you know, I don't, anyone here from California? You know, <laughs> just assembling the land for either, you know, the twin tunnels, which were supposed to bring more water from North Cal Northern California, Southern California, and high speed rail, both turned out to torpedo Jerry Brown, who's kind of like the most successful Californian politician in a long time. He couldn't, couldn't get it done, you know, it just was proved to be uh, prohibitively expensive and uh, took forever. So um, how do you see that problem uh, of being able to actually deploy over hundreds of miles, which means dealing with potentially thousands or you know, hundreds of thousands of landowners? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's far harder than the technology, that's for sure. For, for us, one of the things about the technology itself is because we're in a tube, you can actually go at a lot higher speed and not need such big turns. So the reason is we can bank like an aircraft can which means you can take turns tighter than a high-speed rail because a high-speed rail can't, can only banks a little bit, maybe five, maybe eight <laughs> degrees. And the idea of that means that we can go on faster on existing right-of-ways, existing corridors, than other modes of transportation. So for, in India, for example, the majority of that route is actually built along the median in a highway. And so that's right of way that you don't need to have the government already owns, part of you know, the, the working with the, the government. Um, and really trying to focus on those areas, the median on a corridor between Kansas City and Missouri, or Kansas City and St. Louis, along the I-70 corridor, like right along the median. It's trying to do that. The other thing that's actually quite a bit nicer is because we're enclosed, there's no sound. The, the test facility we have in Las Vegas is elevated, so water and animals and everything can go underneath. 
you're only taking really the footprint of the columns underneath and not needing maybe 20 or 30 yards of berth like a high-speed rail would. Mm -hmm. So we're taking a lot smaller of a footprint, which allows us to go in a couple of different areas, but it's still a massive challenge. And Jakob, as someone who's worked on architecture projects you know, all over the world, um, where do you see as the place where something like this is likely to find the kind of friendliest uh, kind of business environment? Yes, so um, obviously um, <clears throat> we, uh, we work on all scales from the, the, the small uh, uh, gadgets that we run around with all the way up to master planning. Uh, we're even discussing at this point uh, now that uh, technologies, uh, uh, satellites are, are flying around giving us live data of planet Earth, that we, um, that, that the people, or we are essentially almost like able to plan uh, uh, the whole ecosystem of, of planet Earth. Uh, and, and technologies like the Hyperloop um, One will allow us to create master plans for cities. Uh, it will completely change the way that we are doing this. Uh, for example, um, cities around the world, uh, sort of North American cities, uh, cities in, in, uh, in majority of Europe, have all been expanding uh, with this constant that is called the Majetis constant. It means that it will, a, a city border limit is approximately defined by one hour travel time from your home to your work and back. So that's, that's more or less so uh, through sort of the, the whole, uh, the, the last couple of centuries when they developed trains and so on, the cities grew and they followed very clearly this constant. But if you suddenly inject uh, the Hyperloop system into this uh, equation, then theoretically um, uh, designing cities would mean that you could design 350 miles from the city border mm -hmm. and then draw a big circle around that and everything within that circle is essentially uh, uh, a part of the city. Uh, that's where the citizens will live in that area because that will be uh, less than, than uh, uh, one hour distance from your workplace. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> no, I, I think it opens up for a lot of possibilities. Uh, for example, uh, you could live in, uh, um, in beautiful places uh, and then work in busy uh, uh, sort of metropoles. Uh, yeah. uh, so suddenly small countries almost becomes like, a, I, I live in Denmark and all of Denmark would suddenly be uh, this, my city. I could live by the coast anywhere uh, within uh, Denmark, and I would still be able to work in Copenhagen every day. Yeah. I guess just because I'm American and we sprawl our cities everywhere, <laughs> you know, I just, I'm like, oh, that actually sounds terrible in some ways. Um, I mean, Los Angeles feels like that already, you know, uh, speaking as a Northern Californian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, I, I'm curious about um, some of the people that you've brought on board, because um, you've brought on, you know, in the course of this company's history, some very uh, prominent people, both from here at Aspen and elsewhere. Richard Branson uh, was the chairman for a time. Um, tell me about, like, uh, the approach to both, like, gathering funding around this as well as um, kind of gathering world leadership. Um, the... I mean, big ideas have big personalities usually. And I think the, the reason is because it takes a big personality, a big thought to get over the inertia of something that's as radical as we're looking at. So I think the people that are looking at long-term things, like Jakob talked about things, 100 years, space travel, people that are used to thinking about timescales that are not this quarter or the next two or three years, both from a thought leadership perspective, like, like Richard Branson, like a number of the firms that we're, um, we're dealing with, like big, they're looking not at things that are here and now. And I think that that allows, I'll, I'll say, success to come because you're looking at something far in the future, so bumps along the road aren't a big deal. But from an investor standpoint, it's a really interesting mix. You have kind of strategic investors like Virgin, like DP World, Virgin doesn't... DP build. World is big ports yeah. runner, runner yep. out of Abu Dhabi. Uh, they're looking at moving, instead of just moving boxes, moving higher up in the logistics chain. How can you own a better you know, widget, if you will, which is getting your goods or your cargo from one place to another faster? 
Virgin would be an operator, just like they don't build Boeing planes or Airbus planes, they operate them, they would be an operator for us. From an investor point of view, people with, with patient capital. So somebody who's not looking for an exit in two years, somebody who's not looking for a small like number of things, but looking at something of a transformative nature that will take something like 10 years. And, yeah. and if you look at, you know, I worked for a time at SpaceX and they're going from, I'll say garage in roughly 2000, 2002 to putting astronauts in 18 to 20 years later. We're four and a half years old. We're trying to go from a garage to grandma's in 10. Yeah. And that's a different type of thing. It's a very different, I'll say, investor profile than someone's used to having an IPO 24 months after starting a company. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the most interesting acquisitions I saw was that uh, Jay Walker, right, is the new... Walter, CEO. yeah. Yeah. He, I, so he ran the MTA in New York, mm -hmm. and then he ran basically like a version of this in, in Hong Kong. When he shows up, like, what's the first thing he starts asking you about? <laughs> you know, I mean, this is like, that, that, those are major, huge civic operations, and you guys are sort of still primarily a, a technology startup. Like, what's he, what's he thinking about, and how was it different from previous leadership? Yeah, the, so, so Rob Lloyd, who came from Cisco, is our original CEO. Rob was a great kind of like startup, helped us get over the hump, gain a lot of credibility. Jay's a guy who's actually operated transporta transportation systems around the world. And... The credibility, like everywhere we go, people know who Jay is. Like, oh, you ran these massive, you know, transport in London. But the biggest change was he felt very encumbered by technology, right? Like if you're operating the New York metro system, you have to operate in the same tube that they built 130 years ago. You're not looking at how to reimagine it. You're working in the same confines. And so the opportunities for innovation were things like putting in digital signs. <laughs> like when the train's gonna come. He's like, right. that's what my opportunities for innovation were. And so here he gets to basically take all the lessons learned in a completely blank slate and say like, I know about these things that make a transportation system really hard, so let's design away from those things. Sort of like Jakob said at the beginning, like completely reimagining mm -hmm. from 35, 40 years of experience doing it. Yeah. Okay, I'm not taking off my skeptic's hat. It's <laughs> totally gonna work. As you can tell, I fully believe Hyperloop is, is happening. Um, where do you start like designing this system, Jakob? Like, like the actual experience of getting into one of these pods? Yeah, so, so um, I would say first of all, um, I think our, our starting point was to say this is not a train. This is not a, a plane where you sit in a tight uh, airplane seat, put on your belt and then uh, buckle up and you, have, you can't you know, open up your laptop because uh, you know, that, that's off limit uh, during that time. So, so but, but uh, if we then start from, from scratch, um, we were saying uh, you should have the opportunity to have a meeting in there. You should have the opportunity to lounge in and, and do what you need to do. There, there should be a quiet, uh, a quiet pod because uh, the next one, the family pod, leaves uh, 10 seconds later. So, so, so it's... It, the opportunity that is offered here, because you don't have to wait half an hour for the next train or mm -hmm. half a day for the next plane, is that you can create each of these parts individually and tailor them to your specific needs. Mm. Um, and that, and, that, and may, maybe that comes with a premium if you want sort of a, a luxury part that, uh, that has a little bit extra uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, and, and niceness to it. And then, uh, and then you could, the starting point was just saying, okay, if it's not a train, it's not a luxury car for that matter, it's, it's something completely new. We are able to, to st start from scratch. It could be a little bit like your living room or, or, or some uh, sort of a meeting room that you go to uh, in, in your own office. But, but we are completely free to sort of reimagine. And that, that's what this kind of new technologies uh, or, or this new mode of transportation allow us to because there is no pre precedent. Mm -hmm. You know, we are defining uh, kind of the future. It, it gives us this uh, opportunity. And I don't think we should be, uh, we, sh we shouldn't be scared or say, but it, you know, yeah. it has to look like a train or a plane or yeah. something else. And when you start planning the timeline for something like this, like how do you, how do you, how do you imagine? Like let's say it's going to be what, maybe ten years before you have something fully operating. 
How do you imagine what sorts of technologies might be inside that pod in 10 years, kind of interacting um, with the pod as well as you know, the, the people who are inside? Yeah, I, th I, th I think from a kind of entertainment point of view or sort of gadgets point of view, we, we try to step back a little bit and say, OK, maybe there's not like screens everywhere and holograms. Maybe it's actually quite simple. It's like basic meshes. Um, we, we, uh, in the beginning, uh, we were uh, sort of, uh, we were discussing this thing about that you're in a tube and you cannot look out. Right. And th this, was, this was bugging me so much. And, and we we're trying to come up with a way that, uh, that you could look out. And uh, other uh, sort of uh, uh, companies have, have tried to do this with monitors and so on. But the problem is it's always going to be this fake experience. Uh, but then it's, it struck us that because you're traveling so fast, um, uh, in, in Europe we, we calculate in meters, and we ha you are traveling at 300 meters per second. And if you then put a window in at every 10 meters, so that's around uh, every 30 feet, uh, you could have a little hole in the, in the wall, and you have a, also a window in the pod. That would, ex, uh, that would actually be a little bit like a movie. Uh, 30 frames per second, and you would be able, <laughs> it would be like the wall would just become transparent, and you would be able to look out. Obviously, that comes with an extra cost of putting in these kind of portal holes right, right, right. Uh, everywhere along the route, but in theory, um, this is a possibility. Yeah, I think like that was the first interaction that we had three years ago, <laughs> and that was my first interaction really with architects, and uh, that's when I knew like, hey, we could work with these guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, there's also some great like historical reference around this, like when the train was being introduced, people had to learn to like look out to the horizon. Or like when a car was, there was a person who had to walk in front of a car with a flag. Right, yeah, well, to, <laughs> you didn't scare the horses, that seems yeah. fair. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of amazing, like, people had to adjust, adjust their, like, sense of perception, and there's this whole, yeah. you know, 10, 20-year period where people are writing a lot about the kind of, like, where do your eyes go, uh, basically, uh, when you're riding a train and looking out. And I imagine you'd have, because you guys are imagining um, speeds at, like, 650 miles an hour, something like that. Um, I, that seems really fast. To me, um, do you <clears throat> anticipate that there'll be fast ones and slow ones, or do you think the system runs like sort of all at the same speed? Like, will there be a local? <laughs> I don't necessarily think there'll be a local. I think you'll have uh, speed speed limited zones. So, for example, like the first in an area, like if you're going through a lot of turns or through a lot of uphills, you might have to slow down a bit in that area. Yeah. And so while the rest of the system would expand around it, you just happen to have like a speed limit on this section of tracks. Yeah. Um, since we're also talking like very far out transportation technologies, I want to ask you about a couple like prospective competitors okay. in a 22nd century uh, transportation system. One was uh, I recently took a helicopter ride um, where they're really going hard on autonomous helicopters. Because being a helicopter pilot is very hard, and therefore it's very well compensated. Um, and the idea would be that you would have essentially these you know, commuter uh, helicopters. And it's kind of amazing, because it's fast, and it's kind of like point to point. And the thing that kind of blew my mind was uh, Oakland to Palo Alto, which can be a three hour drive at this point, would be three minutes. Um, they'd, Oakland Airport to Stanford, it'd just be like a little drop off. So what do you think? Could, could you take, is, is that a, a prospective competitor or is that, uh, are there things where you think like, oh, that'll never work, that can't happen because of X, Y, Z? I definitely think that will be a technology in the future. I think it'll be limited for two reasons. One, uh, the density of traffic. So like the city that has the most amount of helicopters allowed at any given time is Sao Paulo and it's five. <laughs> <laughs> five or six and yeah. so I think you're going to start seeing you know a it's going to be visually you know not very appealing to see all these you know like large things moving around you start to run out of landing space building space rooftops and things like that so and that's just not even counting like the regulatory aspect I think the other thing is the energy efficiency you know there's it will be its technology um, I think the best they think that electric vertical takeoff will get to is like a dollar per passenger kilometer uh, a bus is about 10 cents. 
You know, right. plane ticket is about 10 cents. Our system is about 10, 10 cents. And, and on that order, like, I think you're going to have a limited, um, a limited demand for that just because of the cost and the energy efficiency of it. Yeah. That's fun. Um, and then there's <coughs> the more obvious one, excuse me, more obvious one, uh, which is just autonomous vehicles of all different sizes, shapes, and, and everything else. Um, that use our existing road network, or I don't know, rail, whatever you, you might imagine. Um, do you see that there would eventually be some major cost savings um, from a um, you know, massively distributed, highly intelligent autonomous vehicle <laughs> fleet that would make this unnecessary? Or are there uh, aspects of the system that um, they just can't go as fast as you can, basically? Yeah, I mean. From my answer, it's uh, even in a world of autonomous cars, which I would love, I still care about how long it takes me to get there. But mm -hmm. you build, you design cities with some of your master plans, so. Yeah, I think all of these different technologies or uh, modes of transportation are complementing e each other. So you would always have an airport. Uh, the, the Hyperloop system is, is limited. You can't fly across big uh, oceans. So you, you would still need airports. Uh, maybe the Hyperloop would, would uh, be sort of uh, connected all the way out to the airport. But, uh, so, and and, and the, 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 where the, the pods are popping out into the, the city fabric, at that point you probably need a car to get there. So, and, and maybe some of these uh, autonomous uh, uh, helicopters or drones uh, could, could, could uh, pick you up at those spots and take you somewhere. So, in a way, I think all of these new technologies are working together to reduce time that it takes you from getting to from A to B in, anywhere in the world. Yeah. And do you think this will be deployed more quickly outside the United States? And do you think it'll be places that maybe haven't put in a road network? You know, another guy I know used to be an uh, a correspondent for The Economist is working on these kind of medium-sized cargo drones. Um, that could also eventually take people, uh, mostly in East Africa, because he's sort of like, well, the, the all-in cost of this versus building roads and building all the other stuff. And of course, like people have talked about this kind of leapfrogging, technological leapfrogging, uh, a, a bunch of different times with different technologies. Um, do you see it going like that, or do you see this as primarily, you know, like a Western European, uh, Chinese American kind of wealthier um, place kind of a technology? I think it's going to be sort of what you described, the, the former, which is places that don't have the infrastructure already or the infrastructure is already saturated. So a project that's really long for us is in India. You know, People don't usually associate a lot of infrastructure with India. The roads that they already have are saturated. It takes you know, five or six hours on what should only be a two-hour drive or three-hour drive. But people are looking for more capacity in their system. So I think anywhere people either don't have the infrastructure um, want new connectivity or have a system at capacity, that's probably going to be the easiest. And I think uh, ones with large population centers, so in Asia, I think are going to be where you see it first. And then I think the areas in you know, like Dubai where land acquisition is quite, quite a bit easier and the regulatory process, decision-making process is more streamlined, mm -hmm. I think you'll start to see it in those areas first because... Uh, things are a lot easier to make decisions with. And do you think for cargo first or people? I think people. 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 Do you think people too? Yeah. yeah. Um, let's take some questions. We have about uh, 15 minutes um, for questions here in the audience. Yeah, let's start here. Thanks, sure. Hi, I'm Carol. I'm an architect in Boston. <clears throat> I was wondering if you've ever ridden in the Hyperlink and what it feels like to go 750 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> not, not inside of it yet. Uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. The, as far as speed goes, I mean, it's roughly the same speed as a plane. The experience would be fairly like a plane in terms of takeoff and landing, except you won't have turbulence. So that martini glass will stay nice and <laughs> nice and where you left it. But I, I think the other thing that is helpful in, in sort of like vision, envisioning this is that when you're getting onto a plane and all the things that you, you don't like about a plane, the fact that there's 200 people on it and how long it takes to board, all of those things, the fact that there's only 20 or 25 people, a pod can pull into a station, station a portal, and you can exchange passengers, you can do everything you need to do in three or four minutes. Um, that's just a transformative experience, and the fact that 
you have pods going sort of not connected but in convoys means that this idea of missing a pod, you can't be late for something that is always there, right? <laughs> and so in, in that way, it's sort of like your own car, which is you're never late for any time you want to get in your car. And I think that's what we're trying to do here is really get rid of this notion that things operate on a time schedule. You know, I just had our first kid about nine months ago and thinking about if he could only watch a show at 8 a.m. on a Saturday, he would think that's crazy, yeah. right? And, and I think, why, why should we think transport's any different than that? Man, you went hiking for two days? You got a nine-month-old? <laughs> have a very nice family. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, we love our transportation. I live in a suburb, Scarsdale, outside New York. Getting in and out of the city is, when the economy's good, good luck. Uh, but the trains still run uh, well, and there's a project called the QNS Rail Project. It's a freight line from the uh, old railways that could connect Long Island City and Jamaica and help with these hubs. So a woman uh, council member, former council member Elizabeth Crowley is behind this, but getting pushback. How do you sh what's the best way to show ROI? They would show six million riders between this link, but they don't, no one seems to want to, there's so many other projects like this, and how do you do the ROIs, and I could bring this back to New York and see if we can get that going. Thank you so much. So if I use the one, uh, we've got a couple of studies that we've finished, one in India, one in Missouri, actually one here in Colorado on the front range. So what we look at is ridership, willingness to pay, um, we've done, in India, we've done about 20,000 actually on the ground studies and surveys of the different modes of transportation. How much, we don't say what kind of mode of transportation it is. We say, if you could get between Mumbai and Pune in 10 minutes, how much would you pay for that? In 20 minutes, how much would you pay for that? In four hours. And seeing like the elasticity of the demand there. But the, the route in India really illuminates a couple things. One, the more riders you can get, and it's not just riders along that specific corridor. It's every time somebody gets on to go somewhere farther. Um, the other thing is sort of willingness to pay. So to give you a sense, in the US, the, I'll say, time cost is $42 an hour. So if you could offset something by an hour, somebody would be willing to pay $42 for that. Um, obviously, India is a little bit different. <laughs> but so if you're looking at a mode of transportation that's faster, if it saves you half an hour, somebody's more likely to pay in the US $21 for that type of thing. And then you can look at the project economics and a few things like that, and we can calculate that out. Yeah, I think there's a broader point to be made, too, just about the building of infrastructure in the US that's pretty interesting. You know, There's a, a guy named Richard White, who's a historian at Stanford, and he wrote a book called uh, The Republic for Which It Stands, where he kind of looks at this period of time in which you know, we're building all this civic infrastructure. You know, It's when all the sewer systems are built, roads, uh, water, all the fire departments are rounding into shape as, as professional uh, units. And you know, I, so I called him up, and I was like, so, why did it work then and it, and it doesn't work now? Um, and he actually has a hilarious phrase for it, like how we ended up building these democratic and systems that serve everybody and that also work well. Um, he calls it the democracy of defecation. That basically, because cities all realized through a series of diseases running through them and fires, that they were in fact tied together, you know, that they were basically on a ship, and people even start using that language, not the ship of state, but like the sort of the ship of the city, that you needed to understand that you had one common um, environment. And I think that right now we haven't very successfully like pushed that out to either regional, you know, places like the whole Bay Area or the entire New York, you know, statistical area. Um, and we certainly haven't pushed it to sort of like the national level either, where people realize that their fates are tied together um, uh, as well. And so I think there's just like something cultural that needs to happen. And um, his take is also that it just takes a lot of calamities for people to really come to believe that, that it, it, there's no easy way to it. Yeah. I mean, it's actually, you know, when you think about that, though, it's not the, it's not that complicated. It, you know, the cities had built most of what came to be part of the interstate highway system. So it's a lot of like rural stuff in the hinterlands, which made sense on a military basis. But if you look at like, you know, the cities I know best, uh, like in the Bay, most of those 
uh, of the piece of the interstate that were actually hard, that were in the city, had, were already highways. Um, and so it just sort of connected up those systems and got a new name uh, that was all, all tied together. I mean, not that it wasn't a great accomplishment in some ways, but um, anyway, yeah. Sure, let's go here and then there. Um, can you talk about uh, in what year you think the first uh, rides will, uh, uh, will be commercially offered? And uh, also, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages compared to high-speed rail, uh, especially as it applies to uh, the cost of tunneling and uh, the cost of um, uh, pr uh, providing it in an elevated way through an urban or non-urban area uh, compared to high-speed rail? So we think we've been working with uh, some of the regulators around the world, here in the US, in Europe, India, Middle East. Certification for passengers, we think, will occur around 2023. And that's really what's sort of the key that unlocks the, the projects actually being built at scale from project finance, right? And that's really, I think, the difference right now is we've got a prototype that we've proven. High-speed rail has trains in operation. They're certified. We get our level of certification. Then the economics sort of speak for themselves. But from an economic point of view, when you look at a tunnel, a high-speed rail tunnel, when that train is going at roughly 200 miles an hour, going through the tunnel, it's dragging all that air around it with it. So the tunnel is pretty big. The tunnel's maybe a little bit bigger than this, the ceiling in here, for a one-way train. For a Hyperloop tunnel, you could fit two ways inside a tunnel smaller than that. So the tunneling cost is quite a bit less because you need a lot smaller of a diameter tunnel. And the energy consumption, the drag, that feeling, the pressure in your ears when you go into a tunnel on a high-speed rail isn't there. Um, and then from the, the aspect of like elevated trains versus Hyperloop, the vehicles are a lot smaller. The weight of the pod is a lot less. So you don't need as massive of a structure to deal with the, the heavy, heavy train that could go over. Um, so your land rights are really maybe just the columns underneath or the, the tube whisk themselves. Um, but that really, I think, makes the total infrastructure cost. When we did the Missouri study, it was about 30% less than high-speed rail for the same corridor, and we're going about two to two and a half times as fast. Hmm. Oh, sure. Dan Perlman. Um, I'm interested in um, supporting this idea as a small investor and wondering how we would get out there as um, people. I mean, it seems like it's a private equity deal right now. So I'd like to understand that mm -hmm. piece of it. Because it sounds like a fabulous idea. Because <laughs> <laughs> you guys are like series C, uh, this or D. Yes, yeah, just finish the C. Yeah. yeah. So uh, short answer is meet me after. I have my credit card swiper. I got Square. Square, no, no. Uh, so the, the ultimate long-term goal for us is to be a publicly traded company. I think that gives, A, a couple of things. One, it gives governments the ability to have you know, financial auditing and a few other things like that. Two, it has a level of accountability and reportability that comes, that's very, I'll say, apt for or appropriate for a a company that's moving people in safety critical systems. Uh, when that actually is, I think, is a matter of quite internal debate. We do like aggregate and do some, some smaller groups of people into some of the bigger rounds with, uh, with some leads. Um, and I could definitely speak to you after that. Usually we have like an LP or a lead kind of aggregate some of their funds in, in that regard. But Just wondering about like, um growing to scale and then in the future let's say that hyperloop is 100 years old what are the um, things that you're looking at in terms of design that you're already planning out for the future oh, man i love the maintenance yeah. question yeah you want to take that one uh, what, what does it feel like 100 years from now uh it's a difficult one i i i think um I think designing for the future is, uh, is sort of a, a difficult uh, thing to to uh, to guess about, uh, you know. Well, like you know, it has to be cleaned, right? Like the tunnel will have to be cleaned. So, like, what's the sort of cleaning machine that runs through the tunnel? <laughs> it's going 10 miles an hour, or it's going 600 miles an hour, you know? Like, 
Yeah, I mean, when we've, when we've looked at the maintenance point of view, the linear infrastructure, the tube itself, is being designed for roughly 100 years. That doesn't mean, not roughly, 400 years. It's being up, kept up in terms of like cleaning on the outside. You've got basically cleaning robots on the inside. Just imagine sort of like the reverse car wash, right? With instead of the brushes on the inside, all the brushes are on the outside kind of going down. The, there's a couple of other things, like the pods themselves have roughly 30-year lifespans, sort of similar to an aircraft. They've got overhauls and other planned maintenance activities and things like that. But if you look at most infrastructure around the world, it's been around for at least 100 years. You know, Golden Gate Bridge is yeah. almost 100. Yeah, more than that. Yeah, and I think in, in that regard, the, the structures that we're picking we're and, and doing, yeah. they're, I'll say, easily upkept. From a concrete point of view or a steel point of view, you can see things that have been around for that long out in the environment. Those are relatively known on, on how to do that. So we've got a more than comprehensive detailed list of all the maintenance activities that we need to do. Um, but I think by the system that we've chosen, we've tried to keep it as simple as possible. And the vehicles themselves, I like to call a solid state vehicle. They actually have no moving parts. Everything is electro electrically controlled, which means there's a lot less wear wear and tear, there's no steel wheels grinding on steel rail, you don't have anything that gets hot, like an airplane or an aircraft engine. So a lot of the things that could go wrong and break down really don't, we don't have a lot of those same issues. Question was on climate change and how would that affect. I think the biggest thing that we'll see is inside the, the pot, or sorry, inside the tube itself, it's a, basically a known environment, really, if it's in Finland, if it's in Denmark, if it's in the Australian outback, it's going to be roughly the same environment inside the tube. Uh, from the outside, if it gets hotter, if it gets wetter, or whatever it's going to be, depending upon the area, I think uh, we just have to take into account how much the tube will grow and contract over a, a given period. And you know, I think you're seeing that the test site we have in Las Vegas is this temperature swing of about 120 degrees from the coldest in winter to the hottest in summer. Um, and aside from really, I'll say, integrating new technologies into the pod, the track is, is really dumb. It's a dumb road, smart car type of analogy. And that gives us the ability to, I'll say, take all the upgrades from battery technology that are coming and not have to change the infrastructure and really, I'll say, absorb and accept all those changes in a really good way. Last one right there in the corner. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, in the uh, category of engineering is fun, uh, like Alexis, a lot of us from the Bay Area, uh, how do you think about earthquakes? Mm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> earthquakes, uh, so there's a couple of systems now that I think are, are pretty interesting. Uh, Caltech has put out this, this basically, I'll say, it's not an early warning system. It's a, hey, there's an earthquake that's happened. It will get to your spot by a certain time. So once those systems basically come online, we can begin to slow the system down. The vehicles themselves have a much higher tolerance to, I'll say, trackway deviation. So for example, the Shinkansen in Japan, which is very seismically active, has had never had any accidents because of an earthquake. We have a, har har a larger tolerance than that system does to deal with things that might move. We would shut the system down or, or slow it down until it's over. And then probably after that, as the pods go, they'd monitor how the track has moved, if it has at all. Um, but those systems, I think, are really giving us a lot of, I'll say, excitement that we'll be able to do this not just reactively, but sort of proactively and be able to slow the system down. But also seeing that the Shinkansen hasn't had any problems in Japan, I think, gives us a lot of room for comfort. Cool. Anyway, thank you so much. That was a fascinating session. Yeah, thank you.